Hello, beautiful human. I am Zach. That is Dana. We welcome <laughs> to the studio for the first time ever, Lawrence. Hey. hey. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. I honestly, for the longest time, thought your name was your TikTok handle. Lawrence the Band? Yeah. That's okay. It's not far off. No, it isn't. But like when I was like searching away, I would search Lawrence the Band. Yeah. yeah. But really all I had to do was search Lawrence. It's true. I feel like there's a lot of like a lot of one name bands, especially if it's like a name, they uh. need to throw the the band thing. Otherwise we're gonna get mixed up on Google with like Jennifer Lawrence and all the other relevant there, Lawrences. There's a decent amount of Lawrences out there. Yeah. yeah. Martin Lawrence. Yeah, but there's none like the two of you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and the other six of you that travel um, with you, right? Eight. Oh, the damn. two of us plus six others. Two, yeah. yeah. Got it. So it's it, holy. That's a. That sounds yeah. expensive. Yes. Yeah. 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 But then cheap in other ways because we all, everyone in the band, one thing we're really proud of. So it's the same group of eight of us that has been together since college. It's me and Gracie and then our six best friends from like childhood. And really expensive, yes. But everyone in the band takes on these other roles that would typically be done by other people like tour management, merch management, mm -hmm. all these things. So we've managed to kind of try to turn it into at least a double-edged sword kind of. Wh whose decision was it to do like a documentary and start following yourselves on the road? And by the way, being very transparent and honest about stuff just like that. Um, I think it was a group decision or really like we were approached by these two filmmakers that were just like hey we want to follow you on the road and we were like okay I mean I don't really see a huge downside to this and we really like them as people and they just came on the road with us for a whole our first tour back from COVID and just like documented everything and yeah it was like a little scary I think because we've never had anyone make a, a documentary about us so that's a new experience but it was cool. It's a different level of transparency. And yeah. do you have discussions before those cameras start rolling in regards to what you're down to talk about and what you're not? Not no. really. I think that, like, because we're siblings and the other people in the band are, like, our best friends, I just feel like we've had such a long-standing chemistry of what we're all about that it just kind of came about naturally. And I think because we've always been told that we do things a little bit differently in our band and we know that it's things that people are really interested in. We're kind of just trusting that if we tell our story and are honest about it and are critical of things that we want to be critical of or honest where we want to be honest, that people are going to dig it and find it interesting. It, it is, it, I find it incredibly fascinating, right? Because like the values of all of you guys clash from time to time, right? And like the reasons why, which I think is like a big question that everybody asks in life and like that, reason as to why it ends up motivating and fueling so much of your actions and what you do and give your time and energy to it's different for everybody right like from my understanding is like you have a quest for fame and they have a quest for <laughs> You're a fame whore. <laughs> they, have a, they have a quest for survival right um, financial survival and independence to you know really genuinely like i don't, I don't think it, it is th that of like crazy like desires and wants that are of luxury materialistic means right I think there's definitely like more overlap than than that in that like I we had one episode that was about fame and we discussed what levels of fame everyone like aspired to in their life and I was you know embarrassingly honest about just saying that when I was younger I think I like desired so much to be famous and as I get older I still have some of that but the overlap that we all share is like we just want to make the music that we want to make in the way we want to make it and be like decent human beings. And that's the through line that everyone shares. And like, that's the commonality. And I think that's why we're still best friends with everyone in our band. A funny thing that you'll, that will speak to what you're talking about is when Gracie and I kind of decided to formalize our musical partnership, because for a while in the early days of it, it was kind of, um, the band was under my name because Gracie was still in like middle school and high school and she would come and sing with us and she was very clearly the star of the show, but like she wasn't old enough yet to have it be necessarily her project. And then at some point we talked about like, let's really turn this from like Clyde Lawrence into Lawrence. And we had this discussion of like, I forget exactly what the bounds that we set were, but I was oh, like, yeah. I was like, cause we had slightly different tastes and slightly different goals as you were mentioning. And I just was like, 
I think that I would draw the line at like, I don't know that we ever need to have like touring background dancers. Like that just feels like (laughs) no project that I'm a part of will organically make sense with that. Whereas like there's a world where Gracie on her own as a solo artist would be doing like the pop star thing with background dancers. And I remember that being like, an example of a line that I we think that of, was good for both of us yeah. now that I look back on it. Yeah. But you both and all of you have this desire to create real genuine music that's yeah. crafted from nothing but just great musicianship. Thank you. And Thank it's you. super obvious. And also like your lineage and heritage where you come from, like, I mean, I had no idea that you were the youngest person to ever be in the songwriter, whatever. Some, yeah, I don't know. You <laughs> made the song for Miss Congeniality. Yeah. The pageant uh, yeah. theme. Yeah. I mean. Is it what William Shatner is singing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what they sing on the bus. You're five years old at the time. Yeah. I think that definitely coining the phrase, she's beauty and she's grace at five years old is my greatest life's achievement. And it's <laughs> all downhill from there, <laughs> for sure. True. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I've been playing music forever. Gracie's been singing forever. We grew. Our dad is a uh, like writer and director of movies and TV shows, um, so not didn't have as much of an inside look into the music industry, but definitely grew mm. up in like a creative family, um, and so we were just kind of like exposed to. We talk about this all the time, like the idea of having like your work be taken very seriously at a very young age, like when from the time that I was writing music at three or four years old or whatever, like the, our parents were like not being like this part sucks or whatever, but they were being like (laughs) talking to me about it as if I was (laughs) talking to us about it as if we were like, really, this wasn't like some fun, silly thing we were doing, you know, taking it seriously. And I think that that made a huge impact on us. So, I mean, are you always like from an early age, at least for the both of you? I mean, what are you thinking about? Like, are you thinking mostly about lyrics? You're thinking about your voice? Like, wh- when does like it transfer into like playing instruments and then arrangement? I think Clyde started like was a musician from birth. Like, that sounds really cheesy, but it's like just true. Like, every video of him from when he's one years old, he has like chopstick chopsticks in his hand, like playing something, or like it's just like when parents talk about seeing their kids and they're like, oh, I, my kid has a proclivity to do something, like, it was so obvious with him. For me, I grew up just always wanting to be a performer. Like, I've done a lot of acting stuff and, you know, uh, knew from, like, a young age that that was something I really gravitated towards. And I think because we lived in the same house, we ended up, like, collaborating on a lot of stuff. And, like, I would, you know sing a lot of the things that Clyde was writing and then as we got older we kind of started taking over each other's roles a little bit more where mm. like I got very involved in the writing and Clyde became a performer and we kind I had of had like, no interest in performing or no no expectation that that would be a part of my life until I kind of learned it from Gracie you know? we kind of just like adopted each other's skill sets a little more as we got older to the point where now we're totally 50 50 like write all the songs together share the stage performing together. When did that start in terms of writing? Like what body of work? You mean like that when you did started we start like collaborating? Share, like sharing 50 It's our first album. Yeah, I mean our first album as like Lawrence, because I came out with an EP called Homesick that we've now sort of retroactively folded into the Lawrence yeah. catalog. And that was fully my writing. Gracie's doing some singing on it, but I'm singing lead on all the songs. And then Breakfast, our first album was mostly all songs that I had written, but that was sort of our first official album as Lawrence, and Gracie definitely did collaborate on the writing of a number of those songs, but it was still kind of holdover from a lot of material that I had written before she got as involved in the songwriting. And then I would say certainly by our album Living Room, which was our second album, we were like totally 50-50 writing all the music together, and then Hotel TV and our new music is is part of that same idea john bellion ends up having you guys open for him yeah and then signing you yeah Are you still with him now yeah, yeah. john is like a or, part of the part yeah. of the family that part of the band so vibe. cool yeah he's the best <laughs> like he's the greatest person but he's also yeah. like one of the greatest artists of all time yeah literally agreed yeah we we uh opened for him randomly at a kind of college festival spring weekend thing 
and we were fans of his. We met him backstage, and luckily he hadn't seen our show, but a bunch of his bandmates who he was, like, really tight with saw our show and were talking his ear off about, like, oh, this opening band was crazy, whatever. So then he was like, damn, I really got to look more into you guys because my, my bandmates were, like, freaking out about it. And then it just started this, like, long texting relationship of, like, us hitting him up when we had new stuff we were working on and us kind of trying to find a time to get him in the studio with us or even just to like sit down and chat. And then eventually we got together and he was like, I want to be involved in helping with the project. I want to start a record label. I want you guys to be the first signing of it. And we were like, that sounds awesome. Do you feel like a major label understood you? Major label? Like was you are signed to Warner now? Very briefly. Yeah, very briefly. Yeah. Years ago. I would say that our music exists in a place that's kind of has pop elements, but isn't totally pop. And I think that I wouldn't say as a blanket statement, major labels do or don't understand us, but I would say up to this point in our career, we're very proud of the fact that we are like independent and have forged our own path. And like, no one's understood us as well as we understand ourselves <laughs> and as well as John, John and the rest of our small team understands us. And so we're very excited about forging forward in that way. But like, I wouldn't put any blanket statements on it, you know? Why do you feel like they didn't understand live musicianship? It's a great question. I think that, I think that just, we exist in a moment when like the music industry is just in a very interesting place where the way that music's made and the kind of music that people responded to and the way that music's consumed just isn't necessarily, doesn't always align exactly with our goals and values when creating music, whether that's because we create music. I, I pride myself on how dynamic our music is, you know, like how many peaks and valleys there are within a given song. And like, even on that basis alone, like that's very different than that's not as conducive to the way a lot of music is consumed these days where whether it be radio or a certain playlist, it needs to be like boom, 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 boom the whole way. Oh, totally. That's one example. Another example is like, I pride myself on how our music really, every section is not the same. It's not as like loop driven and that's not as conducive to the way and the speed at which a lot of current pop music is created. And but I think that our vibe is like, we just want to make stuff that we think is great. And we know that we're going to find both an audience of real people and a group of like industry collaborators and team that are going to rally around it, whatever it is. Yeah. Cause it's real. Yeah. Thanks. People respect real. The music's fucking phenomenal. Thank, Thank you. you. It's great. Thank I, you. I mean, your use of horns is great. Your voice is incredible. Thank you. Are you strategic where you place your vocals and what you're doing with Ron's I don't think I'm strategic about anything, but, um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I've, I feel like I have a sense of what my voice can or cannot do. And so, um, I think like, I just try to really sing. I want, if someone comes to a concert to walk away and feel like, wow, that girl was like really singing. And I hope I always get that message across. <laughs> but when you're in the studio and you have the lyrics, do you know where you want to go with it? Or do you just do like a pass where you just kind of feel it? I mean, the studio is such a different beast than live. Like, oh. and that's something I've really had to discover over the years where like, if you come to a Lawrence show or if you come see us opening for the Jonas Brothers right now, like the belting that I can do on stage has to be transferred to the studio in a different way. So I think there's like a constant calibration of like, how to make this sound like a record rather than the live version. But also mm. when people come to a show, I feel like very often they walk away being like, wow, like I like your vocal even more right now than I did on the, the record. And I think something we've been talking about a lot for like our next album is making sure that those moments still come through in the same way on the record that they do live. Isn't that interesting? Like sometimes people want what they got on the record or what yeah. they're streaming in person. Sometimes they want something totally different, but there is an art to like doing something that's kind of in the middle or. I think it's great. Like, I think some people are going to be like, I like the studio version better. Some people are going to be like, I like the live version better. Some people are going to be like, I like Clyde's voice better. Some people are going to be like, I like Gracie's voice better. I think it's all good. Also, the people, the, that like, <laughs> people that might like the studio version better, like they wouldn't like that better in the live context yeah. and the people that are like oh I like your live sound better like I don't truly believe that 
that exact live thing when put on Spotify in the absence of the energy of the room or the Trend visual rates. that's paired with it would necessarily be as effective. But that's why we do all of it. You know, yeah. that's like, I'm like, great. I'm glad you like that better. <laughs> that's why we have the live version and the acoustic version and the studio version yeah. and I mean, XYZ. But I'm assuming you guys have the musicianship that like every time you do a show, it could be different in some yeah. way. Well, yeah. One thing we're really proud of is that we don't play with any backing tracks at all. Yeah. There's not a single backing track in our set, which is for anyone listening that doesn't know this, huge. like a huge <laughs> minority among certainly mainstream live musicians and we don't do any there's no live auto tune happening to our vocals all of that so that gives us the flexibility to yeah it's eight seven dudes and one girl on stage just kind of playing their ass off and like if i turn around and i'm like one more time we can we keep can going with the song or whatever he has the ability to do things like what like bruce springsteen does exactly like, i don't know real artists that go up there totally. and can do a live show for fucking five hours and Every day can be different because you, you want it to be, right? You yeah. have that ability to ebb and flow like that. Totally. I mean, right now, we're on tour opening for the Jonas Brothers, and our set is so tight in you terms have of to length keep it. that, like, our set's a little more similar night to night on this tour than it usually is. But yeah, on our headline tours, where. Although we of, still, like, change it up a bunch. I mean, we had Tori Kelly sit in with us last night, and yeah. that was, like, very last minute and yeah. cool. And, like, we can just do that. You could see. Yeah. yeah we like, are able to do that. A those lot of things. people can't do that. Totally. Also, you have Tori Kelly, so it's like... Yeah, I mean, she can do anything. That's yeah. sick. <laughs> yeah. Wait, yeah. where were you last night? Anaheim. Anaheim. What the fuck? should have gone. You should have gone. Should've. Hey, what was I doing yesterday? Halloween? Not a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. That's really cool. Very, very cool. Uh, horns. I mean, arrangements. Like, how is this song really starting? I mean, we can start breaking down some records here. But, like, is there one way that you guys start this process? It's pretty really? variable. Yeah. I mean, the horn guys, again, have been in the band with us for 10 years. These aren't like um, hired gun guys where it's just like, oh, you know, here's the parts, blah, blah, blah. Like everyone is in the band. So it's a collaboration. Definitely I do a lot of like the live arrangements and all that stuff. And in the studio, we get the horn guys in. Sometimes we have our horn guys. We also work with tons of outside musicians that we love working with too. But do you know where they want to go or do, do you just like craft a song and then let people jam? Like it's not really the jam thing, but it is a lot of like creating in the moment in terms of, I would say it's less like, let's just l hit play and like do what comes naturally to you. But it is a lot of like me being like, okay, try playing da, 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 da. And then they do that. And then someone's like, what if it's like, da, 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 da. And then they like play that. And then it's like, okay, what about a whole new idea? If it's just like, da, and then they like do that and then we end up having like 10 different options of every single moment and then it becomes almost like a file management process of like which thing do we Puzzles. want to have it be yeah. yeah interesting so i mean lyrically are you starting with story or are you writing to something that you've like essentially produced i mean because there's two of us and like we're mining our own lives for material we often will like come to each other with a bit of something, whether that's like a lyric or a bit of melody or like just some kind of like nugget of an idea or like a full chorus and then be like, do you like this? And then we bring it to Johnny and Jordan and our band who are our producers and John Bellion. And we kind Sorry. of like, we'll build it out from there. Some of those songs have been written just the two of us. Some of them they're written all together. Some of them we've started in the room, but it's always like it's really variable, really variable. And we're not like always starting from, oh, this concept sometimes it's just like I've had this like no, hook no. in my head for so long and I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. So it's on like 23. Yeah. When, when do you actually write that? I wrote the hook of that when I was 22. Um, uh, like prophesizing what I thought 23 would bring. <laughs> and I was pretty accurate. <laughs> I was dating someone at the time who we had like a joke that when I like that 23, the year 23 is going to be so great for me because he was like two years older than me. And I was like, yeah, OK, guy, like you. Why are you so obsessed with the year 23? And I kind of wrote this hook that was basically like, if we break up at 23, that'll be so fucking ironic, like given that you're like talking about how great 23 is. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of right that we did break up, but we're really good friends and it's all good. But 
yeah, I think like I played him that song too, and he was like, "This is really funny." And I, I think like in a way, songwriting for Did you playing the song before you, yeah, up? that's so funny. Um, and I think songwriting is kind of just like this exercise of like trying on different emotions too. Where I was like, we hadn't broken up, and I think I was like just exercising the ability to like imagine what it would be like if we did, mm. and like write something that I thought was sort of funny or like feel that anxiety or like feel that fear before it even happened and then yeah now I think the song is like almost taken on a life of its own of like more of an exploration of just like what 20 the age 23 is in general but it started from that nugget of an idea and then Gracie like wrote the basic lyrics of that chorus and sort of the melody and some of the bits of it and then but not and some aspects of a verse but then like brought it to me first and then we worked on it a little bit, took it a little further down the field, and then bring it to, as Gracie said, Johnny and Jordan from our band and John Bellion. Mm. And then the five of us kind of really go in and write more lyrics, change things, change chords, add sections, do this and that. We fine-tuned that song for like a really, really long time. Yeah. Like, How old were you when you finished it? Because um, you're 26 now, right? I'm 26, yeah. So we put it out now, so like three years. That's wild. But we yeah. we wrote that right at the end of us finishing our last album, Hotel TV, and we were like, "Shoot, should we put this on Hotel TV?" It's but it really would have gotten good. really buried mm. on Hotel TV, and we just like wanted it to be a single and have that kind of like. Yeah, we wrote it when like we already had the release date for Hotel TV set, such that like we weren't gonna give it its moment as like a full standalone single thing. So we were like, "Ah, eh, we'll just save it for the next," and we've just been tinkering with it a little bit over time. Yeah. How does somebody like John Bellion level up what you guys do and make? It's I a mean, great 23 is kind of a good example of it, honestly, because, I mean, he's just like a genius, as you know. Um, but like we we brought the chorus of 23 or like a, a good chunk of the song. And like, I think John is just like a genius at being like, how can we just make make sure that we're making the perfect song around this. And I mean, he's just like, he's amazing also at not wanting to interfere with what we already had going in our careers before we met him in terms of like sound or genre. Like he just came in and was like, I just want to make sure that the songs are like super tight. Everything's like the best version of itself rather than being like, I want people to walk away thinking this is a John Bellion record. And yeah. that's like why he's a genius. And I've also seen how versatile John is in terms of like the role he can play on a song by song or project by project basis, because I've seen him. I mean, we've been lucky enough to like work with him on some of his own stuff or like stuff that is really like he's leading the way on or other people's projects like the Jonas Brothers project where like he's executive producing. Mm -hmm. He's kind of overseeing that creation of that and then on our project he's like depending on the song either playing a super active role or he's kind of like this is a really Lawrencey thing right now I'm here to kind of give my two cents and like sprinkle some salt and pepper on it and like and let you guys run with my advice on it however you see fit and he really like glides between those different roles very gracefully so I think like 23 is a song where he really put his back into it and was like, I love this hook so much that I'm going to make it my mission to help you guys build a song that like situates this hook in the best light. And like, he really put a lot of effort and heart into helping us make that happen. A song like I'm confident that I'm insecure. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. I mean, that's that another was an song. interesting one too. Yeah. Cause we had a lot of that song and I think we played the full song down for John. He was like, third verse should go here rather than here. Like he just like heard the whole thing down and was like, great, I get it. I love it. Let's move this to here. Let's wow. move this to here. And when you sing this part, instead of it being a breakdown, it's going to be like a huge big chorus. So like he just had this mastermind vision of what the song was without changing or like losing what was at the core of it. He just like... That was a, a really vision. <laughs> quick process where wow. yeah. like we played him a fully finished song and he like literally, as Gracie's saying, immediately heard it and gave like one very succinct, but like 
reordering. Large note of like essentially restructuring the last wow. third of the song. That changes the whole thing. And totally. then it changed it. Yeah, for the yeah. better. Totally. Change it for the better. And what's cool is that we kind of kept the spirit of the, if you watch the acoustic version where after the third verse, it then goes into this like long breakdown and build up that then builds to a final thing. That's way more the way we originally wrote it. So it's fun to have preserved that vibe for like the acoustic version, which is a little more sprawling. But yeah, he kind of like very quickly gave this note that just tightened the whole thing up without changing the spirit of anything we had pre-written. He moved around bag of dicks. Bag of dicks. Bag remains. of dicks has stayed. <laughs> Although, yeah, the first line of the song used to be, "Well, fuck, I think I need to go to therapy," and then the bag of dicks line came very closely after that. We, John was like, and I think you agreed with this too. Yeah, a few of us. It's just a lot going from like "fuck" to "bag of dicks." Is just like, <laughs> it's too just much. not. It's too much. It's too much to take in. And, and if you want to, it takes wanna, away, from, it away from bag of dicks, which is better than "fuck." So true, fuck so is true. not as like creative and we landed on well shucks which is honestly way funnier and way better so the first line is well shucks i think i need to go to therapy which like sets the song off on this very like quirky weird tone and then we preserve bag of dicks which we all (laughs) wanted to preserve at all costs thank you jesus thank you jesus who thought of bag of dicks line you of course that of almost any song i think we've ever done you really like wrote almost all of that completely as it is and just brought it to me completely almost finished. Like I'd say giving you what it gives you. Thank you. You can tell. Thank you. I'm not as much of a bag of dicks. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You don't give in time in time. Yeah. I'll work on it. Yeah. No, that song is definitely like a, a uncomfortable look inside of my brain. (laughs) Scary to share a little bit. Although, I think kind of a relief to share in that, like, I I really appreciate songs that are about mental health and can talk about mental health in, like, a really frank way. I think, like, my lens into it is always just going to be, like, through comedy. And I love writing about insecurities, vulnerabilities in a way that is, like, hopefully funny to people. So I think that that was a relief to me that that translated well in like that people related to the idea of like, Oh, we can like have, we can have fun with this too. Like there is a time and a place for the conversation about mental health to be like strictly serious. And then there's also a time and a place for it to be like, we can laugh at ourselves. Your bodies of work are connected to home. Is that correct? Very much so. Yeah. It's really interesting. Like it's all different pieces of your just, yeah. House, right? Your yeah. Our, our, our first f- album's Breakfast. Second one is Living Room, and third one is Hotel TV, which is sort of one that's being like we're not home, and but we're thinking of home. <laughs> and that first EP that I did before right. we officially formed the band was called Homesick. So yeah, I mean it makes sense for us because so many of these, so many of our like stories from our entire life, and then even to this day, stories that impact us now just feel so connected to home to us and we both still live in new york which is where we grew up so the idea of home and family just plays such an active role in the band and in our lives where in new york did you grow up upper, upper west, west side. side oh sick what and what we can edit out definitely not gonna give us your address <laughs> oh, yeah, guys yeah. <laughs> no um, we're from there it's i know the 70s south- oh sick oh my I bet one of my best friends, 72nd and West End. No way. That's very close to where we are. Yeah. 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 Sick. Yeah. Sick. 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 And then uh, we worked on the West Side. We lived on, we worked on 57th and 7th. (laughs) We did. Yeah. 57th and 7th. That's the neighborhood. No, 57th and 10th. Oh, yeah. The subway. That's a slightly more like midtowny. Midtowny. Okay. Relax. No, but it was, it's midtown. It's not upper West. Okay. We're like eight, 10 blocks (laughs) away from you. Okay. We understand. Um, Yeah. And then my other best friend was, uh, God, Columbus Circle. Did you grow up in New York? I grew up in Wayne, New Jersey. So okay. like, we're up, huge fans of Wayne people. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The fans of Wayne's a real place. I, I know. know. Yeah, we, we passed by it. Fucking sick. Yeah. Um, and then um, yeah, yeah. That, so if you pass by Fountains Wayne, that's by my house. No way. Yeah. Uh, so like, that's literally twenty five minutes outside of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Crazy. I, we, we just I worked there every day for like maybe eight years. I don't know, maybe ten years before we left. Maybe eight. 
I don't know. Not about me. It's about <laughs> you. No, but we, <laughs> no, we, we love the New York connection. Yeah. We're very much like New York is very thread through our entire you can hear it. brand and personality. Yeah, I think it's kind of there. Sick. And I feel like there's not that many people in the music space, especially in the more pop music world that are still like fully doing the New York thing, which is part of why we're so connected with John. AJR? AJR yeah. is another one. John. Yeah, there's a small select group of... Jeremy Zucker, kind of? Right. That's true. Max Schneider. Right. Well, he's not well, doing music. He's here. Right now. Well, he's a Hell's Kitchen guy. Right. Well, he's not making <laughs> music in Hell's Kitchen, brother. Okay. I know he's a, Dan's a big Max fan. Dan loves I love Max. Max. We, we love, love Max. Max. And Max is the greatest. You say it like it's a bad thing. No, it's a great thing. I <laughs> he's love amazing. Max. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I love Max. He's incredible. Yeah. I, I know Max a long time. No, he's great. We've we've made some cool music with him and uh, and hung out with him a bunch. We met for the first time when and I he was. He is a real drunk. New York guy, but he is mostly living. <laughs> yeah, we LA really guy did. Now. Yeah. New we, Year's. I found out today that we met for the first time on New Year's Eve when I was drunk out of my face. <laughs> yeah. At Max's apartment. To be fair, I was there for like five minutes. So we didn't have like a long heart to heart. That's or great. That's like why that. you're here today. <laughs> Probably. If yeah. we did, if we did have a long, you conversation, were so friendly. That was my memory of it, and I was sick. like, "That's cool. Bye." <laughs> Damn. Wow. It was great. Well, thanks for showing up here today. Of course. Anytime. Appreciate that very much. What are you yeah. thinking? What's the difference between working with John Bellion and Jacob Collier? Oh. Wow. Wow. I've been trying to get those two in a room yeah, for seriously. a while. I'll tell you that much. Like I've talked to both of them so much about each other and they have so much mutual respect, but we haven't made it happen yet. I mean, they're just very different people, but I think I think they would love each other. Um, yeah, we just did the song with Jacob Collier. And He's, Michael McDonald. And Michael McDonald. It's so good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Jacob is... Jacob is just like one of the most, I mean, I don't need to tell you this, one of the most talented people mm -hmm. on the entire planet. And I think that when I first met him, because I'd been a fan of his for a while, I didn't know what his sort of like perspective on music was going to be because his music is so complex on in certain ways um, that like, I think a lot of people that really love his music are people that are real like, music people and often even a lot of people that are like more in like an academic oh my god yeah they're older and they're uh educated and they have like a different like financial portfolio like yeah. i went to go see their show and it was like <laughs> they own a home yeah yeah it was a very interesting well, it's, I understand it's like it's saying. really like um and i in in the best way like really music for music people, yeah. It, yeah. Or it, it, what, it, it's a lot of things. I think his music's evolved in such an amazing way. But so when I met him, I was so like happy to see that he thinks about music in a lot of ways, I think the same way that I do or that other people do, where mm -hmm. like he's just trying to create music that makes people feel emotions and, um, you know, like certain chord choices he might be choosing are because he feels that those elicit a certain reaction out of the people the same way that I think about it, the same way that someone else thinks about it. But he's operating with such a musical vocabulary and and kind of catering to his own tastes, which are so elevated that like the music just comes out as existing on this like totally intergalactic plane in a really amazing way. So I love, love talking with him about music. And then John's on a totally different thing where John's a great musician, but he's not as much like the person sitting down at the piano, breaking down the, the different complex chords. Honestly, like a fun thing about my relationship with John is that when I'm working with him, I often get to be that person that's like getting into the super nitty gritty of like certain music theory things. And John is like so tapped into like, what is the story of the song? What, what is feels right? What feels right? What is like, how does this song relate to like, what's happening in culture right now and all these different things. So they're both like so brilliant and both of them make music that really affect people. But I think where their mind is at a little bit is maybe a little different and it's so cool. And I kind of feel a little in, in the between. When you're crafting any body of work, are you telling a full story or are you just trying to tell a story in every song? We've, talked a lot about like our albums being like seasons of a TV show. I feel like we're at, like when we list our influences up there with, you know, 
Stevie Wonder and Randy Newman and Aretha Franklin is you like, can hear Randy Newman. It's so funny you said that. Like your music is incredibly literal, very yeah. on the fucking nose. Yeah. Well, we try to be conversational in our lyrics, and and, and comedic, as Grace was saying. But up there with those influences are Seinfeld and you play the scene. Yeah, exactly. Seinfeld and The Office and other TV shows that we love. Like the next album is just the next season of a TV show. So like the whole album isn't about one thing the way a whole season of a sitcom isn't about one mm. thing. But like you're going to get the episode that's like the check-in on Gracie's love life. You're going to get the episode on the check-in on my personal life or on um, our opinions about our career or whatever the same way that you would. But like each season, each album is kind of like the next beat of that story rather than having it all be about one thing. Yeah. So is there any drive or want to have a hit? <laughs> it's a great question. I think yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think that like we want to make the music that we want to make and we want it to be as successful as it possibly can within the context. Of We've that. always said like we we are just writing the music that we wanted and want pop music to be and like that's we're not going to change what we're doing for the sake of like we're never going to sacrifice what we like that's just like who we are but we think that there is like a lot of potential for it to reach people in a cool way and oh, we've had yeah. moments of that too so i think like we had a song called don't lose sight off our last album that was huge was we're independent and we had the song um i think it was the highest charting song of a truly independent band that was in top 40 radio and like that was a huge achievement i think for everyone feeling like wow this is really cool like we're just making the music we want to make exactly how we want to make it with people we love and like respect and like look how far this song went without the infrastructure of a huge label behind it and that is like it, it, freaking incredible but like it, it also attributes to so much that's going on in cu culture and the way people are consuming music today yeah. and where it's going and that's totally. why I do believe that like yeah you guys are making real music at the right time thank you we uh, like we I think to Gracie's point and to what you're saying like we kind of love the stuff that we love and like the hope is that that like we like the tastes of pop music are kind of going on its path and the tastes of our musical evolution are going on its path and the hope is that they're gonna like <laughs> have these moments of like crash course like don't lose sight was like a little moment of that crash course and then like hopefully there will be other moments of awesome Where they crash converge. course yeah. yeah but we're not gonna like necessarily always bend to it but I remember I took a meeting when I was 13 years old with a uh, with a like a publishing executive and I was playing him a bunch of music that ended up being some of our music and it was all this very kind of like soul funk stuff and I remember him saying to me, this is a direct quote, no one's interested in a 14-year-old Stevie Wonder right now. And like that was during the era Crazy. that would have been in 2007 or 8 when like it was all EDM. It was all like, like in that moment, the sound of what I was interested in was really not popular right then. And I was like, wow, that's like a wild quote <laughs> about like, in my opinion, the greatest artist of all time. And... Like, and not to say that I am a 13 year, was a 13 year old Stevie Wonder, but the that was your influence. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and then like, of course you, st I remember hearing fuck you by CeeLo Green on the radio and being like, That's it. this is interesting. And then hearing so like much Bruno Mars, Bruno stuff. Mars yeah. and then hearing other artists, whether it be Taylor Swift or Justin Timberlake or all these pop artists starting to bend into this more soul oriented Horns were becoming thing. More Horns of a thing. you started hearing everywhere. And I was like, this is just the crash course of like, yeah, like at some point there is gonna be a cool convergence between what we do if we stay our course and what people dig. And that's it. You have to stay your course and totally. be consistent with it. Yeah. Do you guys listen back to Don't Lose Sight and try to figure out like why mm -hmm. that connected to people two, three years ago? I think we not this is gonna sound so obnoxious, but I think on the day we wrote it, we were like I think this will connect with people. So I it's I guess I do look back on it and think like, oh, that's awesome that we kind of predicted that right or like put the right emphasis behind the right song. 
But I think it makes sense to me in a lot of ways. I mean, first of all, there was a pandemic and mm. the song was about not giving up and about being hopeful. So I think there was a certain timeliness to it that made it super relevant. But I think it's also just like for us, it's a song about not giving up, but also not. Uh, I don't think it's super cheesy. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that that's like a big part of it. I think like there's a, if the song was called Don't Give Up, I think that would actually be worse. Like the fact that it's even called like Don't Lose Sight, which is like a little weirder and that all the verses are Clyde being really negative <laughs> and then the chorus is me being really positive. I think make it made it like a palatable song about optimism because we had such heavy doses of negativity in it. Yeah, I don't um, think like you would think a song that starts with the lyric, Are you kidding me? I'm getting sick of the industry, sung by a guy that sounds like Randy Newman, <laughs> that we would be like, Oh, this is gonna be our biggest hit to date. But I think we really did leave the studio. Fe- I think that like it's important not to like we we're not blind to what what is like pop music taste. It's not like we're existing without any sense of an awareness of that. It's just that we're not letting it drive our process. So like when Mm -hmm. we did naturally write, don't lose sight, when we got, when we wrote that song, we weren't like, let's try to write something that fits more into the pop thing. But when we did just come upon that hook and we were like, wow, this has this like really universal message, even though it's being written about something like very specific to us. And even though it has all these like gospel chords that we love that you don't hear in pop music that much, we left the studio that day being like, oh, this actually feels like something that could really cross over in that way. But importantly to me, like that wasn't driving the process of creating yeah. it at all. Do you hear growth between it's not all about you and what you're putting out today? No, I'm still that obnoxious. Um <laughs> I'm still that terrible of a person. No, I think, um, I think our songs grow. Like I think Mm. us, we as artists have grown and like our tastes change like 10% per album. But I think maybe less than other artists, like a song like It's Not All About You off of our last album has a lot of comedy, has a lot of horns, has a lot of like party energy. And I think that those are things we don't like throw away album to album. Like we'll keep, we'll retain that kind of like core of who we are and whatever we put out next. So I hope I haven't grown too much from it. That was one of the first two songs that John produced, right? Yeah, Yeah. that and Casualty were the first two that we made with him. I think it goes back to like the TV show analogy for me of like, I feel like we're on to like the next season of the TV show and like the stories we're telling right now are like more relevant to my life right now than ever and like the way that we're producing them is more in keeping with like the tone the equivalent of how sometimes when you watch a new tv show or when you watch a new season of your favorite tv show the camera work is like 10 percent different than it was (laughs) last season and takes some adjusting to get used to but then sometimes you're like oh wow they're really like using a new technique in a cool way. Stepping it up. Yeah, it's that same thing of like we're stepping it up, but there's a charm to our first album that I still love, even though it's not exactly how I would produce music now. So yeah, I think we're, it's all kind of there. We're we're not people who like, I definitely look back at things we put out and I'm like, oh, I could have sang that better and stuff like that. Like I definitely feel that way. But I definitely have also like a lot of love for what we did when I was 18 and being like that, that's like a time capsule. Like I love having that. I love having that on a record and being like, this is what 18 year old me sounded like. This is what I was thinking about at 18. And I think that's, I I think that's really cool. Even if it's not what I would necessarily do exactly right now. By the way, all of Lawrence's music is waiting for you. It's on Amazon music. There's going to be a link in the description below. What are you thinking? What do you guys learn about yourselves as like a band playing arenas and stadiums every night? It's a a really good question. I think what I've learned is that like the dumb shit that we do in a club translates really well on an arena and a stadium (laughs) stage. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we started by playing like college basement parties. Which are the best parties, by the way. Totally. Um, I was in high school. It was like the best time of my life. Yeah. Yeah. And we would like do crazy stuff like. I mean, not crazy stuff, but just like, what are you talking about? No tracks, just people playing instruments loud, giving it their energy. Gracie 
doing push-ups and jumping, jumping jacks on stage and us randomly in the middle of songs switching and playing each other's instruments and doing all Juggling this goofy, quirky red stuff. Solo cups, and, whatever. And, like, and, and the horns refusing to like ever pre-discuss a dance move, but instead like agreeing that they're just going to come up with things on the spot. And like that spirit has totally retained up to where we are now with our own headline shows, which is like playing to anywhere from like two to 6,000 capacity venues. And then, yeah, that translates up to arenas too. Literally in this, in our little set of opening for the Jonas brothers, you will see us literally running around the stage Gracie doing push-ups, <laughs> us all playing each other's instruments at the same time, the horns doing a number of ridiculous unplanned <laughs> skits and dances, and like I feel like like people. It's people a lesson it. in committing to the bit because I think like you get on a stage like that, and your first instinct is to be like, I have to be a, a normal person, and I have to make people like me, and then you're like, oh, we've been doing. I mean, we've been on tour for a really long time. We've been working for a really long time. And, like, getting on that stage, it's sort of like, do your show. Like, do you in a really big way. Like, lean in even mm -hmm. harder to what you yeah. are rather than go the other direction and be like, oh my God, there's all these new people. Maybe I should, like, be a cool girl. Yeah. <laughs> like, do exactly what yeah. got you there to begin with. Totally. Although but it's I, funny how your first thought 100%. is like, oh, I should dress like a totally different person. And then you're like, that's so stupid. I will no. say, though, it's a fundamentally different thing opening than headlining. Yes. Like, but oh, yeah. it, it is do your show, like we're all saying, but it is, yeah, almost like do more. Like, if you come to a Lawrence headline show, we're going to tell more stories between the songs. We're going to yeah. play more ballads, songs that we know people listen to because they're our fans and there's a little more patience required and maybe open up the solos a little bit more and all these different things. For this, it's like, we need to, like, grab everyone by the throat and be like, pay attention to us because if we give you even five seconds of permission to not pay attention to us, mm -hmm. you won't. Huh. You're not yeah. here to see us. You may not have heard of us. Now you gotta like, be the biggest version of yourself and educate totally. them at the biggest same time. version of yourself. Totally. Exactly. I gotta come see you guys while you're you doing really this do. run. You really do. Please do. Yeah, like, I, are you doing it, like, through, the, like, until the new year or through December? It's 65 it. shows. Holy. Which is wild. Okay, so I'm, I'm, you We're, got, like, two-thirds done. We're, like, damn. done 40-something. Oh, I got and, time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be in New York at the Barclays Center. That's the last show on December 9th. And then we will be doing our own headline shows, like, next year. We'll announce that. At some point, I'm gonna look at some know. dates. You guys, yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I come to you, or do Please I have to? <laughs> There's not. Call we just Nick finished. The, you can talk to my people. The, uh, yeah, it's fine. It's oh, we'll look it up. Yeah, we'd love Sick. to see you there. I do know Big Rob. I don't want to brag about wow. that shit. He's a, he's, he's, he's the come sweetest. Come out to a bunch of the shows. Of course, the nicest did. guy. He's a real one. Yeah, yeah he's great. He's amazing. No, he's been around like for since the dawn of time, but also like rides with so many artists that like you don't even know. Totally. Outside of the Jonas Brothers. Totally. What role did you guys play in the last Jonas Brothers album? So me and Johnny and Jordan, the two guys we mentioned earlier who are kind of the primary producers of the Lawrence music, the three of us formed a little production team called The Diner. Um, <laughs> very New York. Yeah. And uh, and so we have kind of worked on some music for other people, often in collaboration with John. I mean, really a lot of it stems from the fact that, as we were talking about before, John is a real New York holdout, really like makes people come to him if they want to work with him. It's which crazy. I respect the it's crap so cool. out of. He has like a whole setup in his basement, right? Where yeah. people can oh, stay. Yeah. yeah that's Tori an Kelly was telling us. We huh? live there. Yeah. So <laughs> okay, we practically yeah, yeah. live there. Yeah. So John has this like amazing thing going on out on Long Island where he's got a fully full fledged, you know, community and recording studio and all this stuff. Like, you know, all these people that he works with, which we've been lucky enough to be part of. He's got this group of like New York producers that amazing. he kind of brings together on different projects. So we Tori Kelly, um, Basically, me, Johnny, and Jordan, and John, and this kid, Ten Rock, that John works a lot with, we all lived with Tori out on Long Island for like a month and a half and basically made a whole bunch of music with her. And then, yeah, on the Jonas Brothers album, um, we were like kind of in and out of involvement on that, but we wrote and produced on a few of the songs. And then also, even on ones we didn't produce, I'm like 
singing background vocals or playing um, like uh, that melodica solo on Vacation Eyes. That's me playing that, oh, even though I'm not like a writer on that song. Clyde very proudly played drums on the song Walls, that's which true. I feel I need to give him a shout As out a, for because he <laughs> doesn't often play drums and it was a very exciting moment for him. That's true. I, I, my, I, we were talking about how I got my early start in music. As like a two-year-old, I was like obsessed with drumming and I don't get to play drums as much anymore because we have an amazing drummer in our band. But on Walls, which is one of the songs that we helped write and produce... I did play the drums on on that epic outro, which is Sick. a real claim to fame for me. You really could do everything, yeah. Only music. <laughs> I can do. I can't do like every other artistic endeavor. Like Gracie's so good. Gracie's a great actress, a great dancer, a great. I'm not even a great visual dancer, artist. But thank you're you. really good too. Thank you. I'm completely incapable <laughs> in every artistic endeavor. <laughs> mostly outside of music. And then I'm good at other random things like building spreadsheets and like... <laughs> Clyde's one of the best settlers of Catan players in the country. That's what? true. Well, it's an honor to be in your presence. <laughs> did you play? I mean, I have played. Do I play I'm actively? Big, no. I'm a big board game, board game person. I love Monopoly. Right. Yeah. The, <laughs> wow, you just I, fucking shut me. <laughs> you right. just gave me the um, look and said, no, no, fuck no, well, you, What I was going to say is like, I feel like Monopoly is kind of like a entry board game, but then there are people that take Monopoly really seriously and get really, there's like all kind. our brother's math teacher well, was like the Monopoly champion of America. You know who? Really? Yeah. That's really cool. There's a YouTube video about him and he really breaks down. You're like, oh my God, I didn't realize you could possibly like have so many strategies. Oh, uh, I got to, I'm going to watch that. Yeah. Max plays Settlers of Guitar. I know. I've played with him. He probably he, kicked his ass. Yeah. I think I did win. We'd have to. We should ask him. But I did play with him and his friends a couple days after that New Year's party because he knew that I, that my reputation precedes me. And the whole time we were like, that guy Zach Sang was so drunk. Yeah, yeah. I knew it. Um, no, but seriously, you're one of the best in the country. I. That's very kind of you to say. I. I think it's and, true, right? Yeah. I mean, how do you know that? So I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story right now. So during the pandemic. Me and a few of my friends started playing Settlers of Catan like every day as a way to kind of just do something during the pandemic and to stay in touch with our friends. Like over Zoom, we were playing every day. We built this spreadsheet that kept track of who had won against who, and we were all pretty even, the five of us. How but are we were you playing only, a board game over Zoom? Um, there's a website that you can play Settlers on, like online Settlers, but oh, then cool. we were like also going on Zoom so that we could negotiate trades and stuff. Got so it. it was kind of, you had two screens up at once. And then we I'd took, walk in the room and I'd be like, wow, Clyde's on a really important call right now. And, and it was just always settling. And I'd be like, if you don't give me a wood for this sheet. Um, but yeah, so then we kind of realized we were like, we're taking this really seriously, but we have no idea how good we are in the context of the outside world. And then when the world opened back up, we entered like the New York City wide tournament and all of us did really well in it. And out of like hundreds of people, Several of the five of us made it into like the top four and one of us won the New York, not me, but we were all kind of equal The five of us. One of them won New York City and then several of them, I was actually not free to go to nationals because we were on tour, but several of them that went to nationals, keep in mind, this is like them having never played much against anyone other than within our little five person community. And <laughs> one of my friends, a different one than the one that won the New York one, my friend Eric Freeman, who is the star in our It's Not All About You music video, he's the guy Plug. in the diner, <laughs> he won the national championship. What? Wow. And then we all went to the world championship <laughs> in Malta <laughs> to cheer him on where he came in second. Oh, it was so, hard. I watched it over Zoom. He got really close to winning. Oh, yeah. No, he got eight whatever, points, yeah. he, which was second most in the championship. He wow. Had, out of, so out of thousands heart, of people that were in these uh, various national championships. So I have no personal claim to being one of the best, but... I, By association. I'm in a very tight-knit community of Settlers players in which we are all fairly equal in how much we win against each other with the guy who is the national champion and second in the world. That's crazy. Wow. So who's Shout first out to in Eric the world? Freeman. What'd you say? Who's first in the world? Um, this guy, I think his name was Hamish. I think that he was representing New Zealand, either New mm -hmm. Zealand or Australia. But there were people at this tournament 
from every, there was like hundreds of different countries represented and they played so many rounds and it was like surreal that my friend Eric made it to the final table. In fact, the finals were on the next day and most of our friends that had come out had like booked their flight home for the day that the finals would be being like, he probably won't make the finals. And then everyone was like rebooking their flights out of Malta because <laughs> we're like, fuck, he made the finals. We should really stay and watch this. That's iconic, dude. It was crazy. From like a COVID hobby to something that is as serious as it gets. It's really like a beautiful story of like <laughs> us finding, <laughs> you know, if I may. I know, my, it's a beautiful story. I, I think that it's like a group of friends finding a way to keep in touch over this board game. Okay. And then that turning into like us getting so obsessed with it that we yeah. realized we were doing it on like a world class <laughs> level. <laughs> That's a beautiful story. Yeah, it's true. By the way, Lawrence's music is sitting uh, at, 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 like at the link. Uh, in the description below, Jesus, <laughs> sorry. It's all on Amazon Music. Final thoughts? Yeah, the last question I had is like, is your relationship, are you guys like brother and sister, working relationship, business par bar business partners? Like, how do you guys view it now? It's a great I question. Think all of the above. We've always been really close, like our whole lives. And we have a younger brother who's amazing and super talented too. And we're all three of us super close. I think as like, you know, when we entered into this band together, like officially, I was like 17 or 18. Clyde was in his early 20s. And we had this like conversation of like, I guess we're going to like start a, essentially start a business together. Mm -hmm. And I think we've learned so much about each other in that time that like, honestly, I probably didn't know about you in a kind of a cool way yeah, for the first closer. 17 years of my life. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it's definitely brought us closer and I feel like I know everything I could possibly know about a human being. <laughs> we really are all of those things that you said. Like, we are brother and sister. We are really best friends. Yeah. We are creative partners, business partners, often roommates um, or bus mates, you know. But, like, when we stay at hotels, usually roommates in the hotel room or whatever it is. Because we also often have just, like, so much work we need to do together so we're just like we should just room so we can discuss these yeah. 10 things mm -hmm. <laughs> and it and so it really does it, it is all of those things and then sometimes those things happen at the same time and that can be like really great and then sometimes that can be complicated you know there's definitely moments where it's like okay like I want to be your brother and your business partner and your creative partner right now and she's the equivalent for me and it's like you have to kind of balance those things in different moments in terms yeah. of the literal in the moment, choosing mm. what to say might have three different options and you kind of have to like say the thing that respects all of those things at if once. If I'm like having a really hard day, but I have like nine work things that I'm supposed to do, like what is Clyde supposed to <laughs> do in terms of being like, we need to get this thing done versus like that's just take like an example, day. you know. <laughs> yeah, that happens. No, 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 I mean whatever. But that's Our just like it is. Laughing in the background. Yeah, but <laughs> that's just a real like those kinds of things come up, or you know, just like balancing what, which hat you're wearing on the day. Are you wearing like a personal sibling one or your or in the on moment. work mode? Yeah, it's kind of and on stage. On stage, like, yeah. Literally, like there's moments where like we connect up on something on stage and it's like, so feels like we're having like a brother sister moment more than anything else. It's just so Cause you can just like read someone really quickly. That we, is definitely a sibling thing of like the other night you like couldn't hear yourself for a second in your ears. And you just looked at me and I was like, I know he's wondering whether I can hear him in my ears. Cause that will determine whether the problem is that something's wrong with, my someone ears thinks wrong with his ears versus his mic. <laughs> And I was like, as in, I can hear him. And we like discussed it after. And I was like, weird. it was really, really weird. really helped me out yeah. because I literally started playing and I said in the talk back, Mike, I was like, I have none of myself in my ears. And then Gracie just like looks at me and goes like this. And I just was like, okay, thank God. Like I can manage without hearing myself as long as everybody else can hear me. Um, that was like a cool moment. We have a song. You can manage without hearing yourself? Yeah, the college basement days, man. You know, I, I didn't. Because in that moment, like you're not like it's right, you can't hear anything that's going out, really, because yeah. you're behind the speakers. Yeah, but you know, it really is. It's like we got the best prep in the world. Huh? It's playing true. At these parties, like I could totally playing without my keys would be a little tough. But yeah, I could I could do a show without hearing myself singing at all. I'd probably blow my voice out more. That's more how it would affect. Is like I would sing huh. harder to compensate. But we have a song. 
the last song on our most recent album, Hotel TV, is called Figure It Out, which is kind of the only song we've ever written about our relationship with each other as siblings, which is something we kind of realized. Well, really what happened was Gracie and I got in a bit of a fight, and Gracie just wrote this beautiful, not even song, but just like this chunk of a song um, that almost felt like a verse of like a Broadway song or something and just sent it to me. And it was unclear like what the goal even exactly of it was. I just felt bad. And I was yeah, like, it was Here. like almost her like <laughs> apology note about her side of the story to me. And I was just like, it made me think like, wow, this is really beautiful. And it's crazy to think that in all the songs we've written and in the, our many seasons of a TV show, to use that analogy again, we've never really addressed our dynamic. Mm-hmm. And so then without telling her, I then wrote a whole, my entire apology slash side of the story chunk completely independent of her. And we just, those, and we had a very unusual song structure in which the song is just her whole chunk, then my whole chunk, and then the whole outro of the song, which is like this big epic outro that teases all the other songs on the album and, and kind of the weirdest song form we've ever had, but also a really like fitting end to that album and still the only song we've put out that really addresses our relationship. By the way, you can listen to it all. It's waiting for you on Amazon music. There's a link in the description below. It is beautiful what you guys have and yeah. the, the actual music that y'all make. It's really, thank you. Respect thank you. it and appreciate it. And a massive fan. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Appreciate it. We're like, big fans of you guys. Yeah. Well, come back whenever, hang Sweet. out. Absolutely. We're yep. always here. We were supposed to go to the show at Dodger stadium, but our producer took those tickets. What yeah, the hell? Where are they? <laughs> He'll be in here soon. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get you guys out to a show soon for yeah. sure. We I would love that. We hope so. I'll yeah. go. I'll fly somewhere. Come Let's to Barclays. It. It'll be the last show on the tour. Yes. And I'm, yes. And we'll have a party. We'll have an after party. I live oh. like just a few blocks from Barclays. So yeah. I'm going to get to walk home from the last oh. show of a four month tour. Giddy up. I'll be there. <laughs> Actually, I will be there because I'm going to be in. T- it's December 9th. I don't I'm know. I'm in town around that time. I'll be there. You're definitely. Let's make come. it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you want to sit in on a song? Yeah. Oh, sh- whatever that. No, no. No. I mean, what is. Yeah. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you mean you want to sing something. Me. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's broad. It's too broad. Give me some, give me yeah. some guardrails. You know what I mean? We'll figure. We've had, we've had some crazy sit ins. I'm trying to think of what we've I had. mean, I don't say. Do magic. Yeah. You can hype up the crowd. Shit, I can tap dance. No, I'm kidding. Fuck yeah. We've had dancers come up. That's hot. We've had <laughs> that's hot. <laughs> that's what yeah, yeah. Call we tap dancing hot. <laughs> yeah. You've had dancers like like people. We've had people come up and propose to what people else on stage. Well, that's you have anyone you want to propose to? I mean, I have a boyfriend. I think that would be a huge. That step. would be so, so great for it. our show. Yeah, I'll think yeah. about it. He'd yeah, love yeah. it. He, honestly, he'd fucking love it. We've yeah. had a lot of a lot of unconventional. Maybe, maybe a good uh, proposal at the Barclays Center. Oh think my god! It. Did we just no, make this no, happen? No, no, no. Maybe I'll think about it. I'll think get back to you. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll come up something. with something good. But seriously, listen to Lawrence's music. It's waiting for you. Link in the description below. You good? Yep. Thank you guys for being Thank here. You Thank so you guys much. so much. Appreciate it. Really appreciate you. Lawrence, yeah. everybody. Woo. Amazing.